Well, let's turn to God's word together. And this evening we're looking at those final four verses of Philippians chapter one from verse 27 to verse 30. Now, as we turn our attention there, let me begin by asking you a question, something to think about in uh, your mind as we begin. What do you think is the most important thing uh, for a church that is starting to face opposition for the world, from the world at large? As the church is beginning to face opposition from the world at large, what do you think is the most important thing for that church to be thinking about? What springs to your mind as you start to think about that question? And the reason I ask that question is that this question is answered for us by Paul in his exhortations in today's passage. This is a a question that Paul uh, provides an answer for for us through the way that he directs uh, the Philippians in these verses. We remember that Paul has just been discussing the possible outcomes of the situation that he finds himself in there, um, as he was under house arrest in Rome. He's been discussing whether, on the one hand, he might be freed and be free to resume his uh, previous ministry, and that in time he'll be able to once again visit the Philippians in person. But he's also, on the other hand, thought about the very real possibility that he might um, be executed, that his his imprisonment might end for him in death. And Paul, in those previous verses, even uh, spoke about what his preference might be in that situation. He said that if it were up to him, he would be happy to go to his death, happy to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, he says. But Paul also acknowledged, didn't he, that for the sake of the Philippians and the others to whom he ministered, it was better and therefore more likely that he would be spared, that he'd be uh, freed, that that he'd remain alive and be able to continue on with his ministry. And now as Paul continues his letter, he turns his attention to giving uh, instructions to the Philippians, to exhorting them. And as he does that, he says in verse 27, whatever happens, whatever happens to him, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit. And so Paul goes on. Paul says, whatever happens to me in this situation that I've just been telling you about, regardless of what happens to me, Paul says, this is what you are to do. Paul says, this is what you've got to do. Forget about me now, this is what you have to do. And Paul says, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Here Paul actually, uh, in these verses, in that verse, introduces a concept to which he will return um, at the end of chapter three, and that's the concept of citizenship. Paul, in this verse 27, says something to the effect of, live as citizens worthy of the gospel of Christ. And then in chapter three, he'll say, uh, at the end of chapter three, as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly wait a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. And the reason uh, it seems that Paul uh, introduces this theme of citizenship is because citizenship was important to those in Philippi. Philippi was a, a Roman colony in Macedonia and they had been granted Roman citizenship, which was for them a, a matter of considerable pride. And by introducing the concept in his letter, Paul seems to be highlighting here their role in contending for the gospel in that context, in their context as Roman citizens. That involves, therefore, an evangelistic focus that as those living as citizens, where they are in the Roman colony of Philippi, they are to uh, 
um, be contending for the gospel there, living out the gospel there, seeking to share the gospel there as citizens. And yet, of course, as he'll return to the theme in chapter three, Paul at one and the same time is hinting that ultimately the Philippians are citizens of another kingdom. They're citizens, more importantly, of a heavenly kingdom. And it's their citizenship of this heavenly kingdom and it's uh, the the kingship of the Lord Jesus Christ that ultimately uh, dictates how they are to live their lives in the time and in the place that they find themselves in. So as citizens both of Rome and of the heavenly kingdom, they are to live how? In a way that is worthy of the gospel, in a way that's worthy of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what exactly that means is what Paul then goes on to flesh out. The next few verses, not just the verses that we're looking at tonight, but all the way down to verse 18 of chapter 2 is Paul fleshing out what it means, what it looks like to live in a manner worthy of the gospel. And at the heart of Paul's message as to what it looks like to live in a manner worthy of the gospel are these themes of humility, of love, and of unity. Paul, of course, has those famous words in uh, chapter 2 and verses 5 to 11 where he points to the humility of the Lord Jesus Christ as the ultimate example of this. And for us then, as we uh, seek to live uh, worthily of the gospel, we are to do so in a way that is humble, in a way that is loving as those who are united together by the gospel. We live worthy of the gospel when we are humble towards one another, when we love one another, and when we're united together as God's people. And that's what Paul begins explaining in these verses here at the end of chapter one. And as we dig into these verses, it's important to remember why Paul is writing these words. It's not just that the church in Philippi needed to be more humble and more loving and more united, though it's true that they did need to be more humble and more loving and more united. And it's not even just that there was um, some disagreements in the church. There were some people who were disagreeing, who needed to agree and move on. It's not just for that reason that's Paul writing, although we see in chapter four that that is exactly what was happening. Remember that Paul's concern relates to the opposition that the Philippians are facing. That's what Paul is addressing here in these verses. Paul's thinking about the opposition that the Philippians are facing from outside of the church. That's why in verse 28, Paul says, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. Paul has in his mind those who are in opposition to the church in Philippi. And likewise, in verse 29 and verse 30, Paul talks about suffering for Christ. And then verse 30, since you were going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now here I still have. Paul is saying, you're going through the same struggle that I had. You're facing opposition from those who are outside of the church. And so Paul, in urging them to live in a manner worthy of the gospel, is all the while concerned about how they'll respond to the opposition that they are facing. They've heard all about Paul's house arrest in Rome. They've heard about the threat to his life, just as they saw the opposition that Paul faced when he was amongst them, how he was thrown into prison there in Philippi. And now they too, the Philippians themselves, are facing the same opposition. Pressure is no doubt being put on them for their belief in the gospel, for their proclamation of the gospel. And as this opposition to them increases, It's fascinating, isn't it, how Paul exhorts them and instructs them. As opposition increases, we might expect Paul to say, well, make sure that you all go on a training course. Make sure that you know exactly how to articulate and defend the gospel powerfully and uh, precisely and persuasively. Or we might expect Paul to say, Um, It's important to make sure that you get legal advice, to make sure your church documents are all in order so that as um, the challenges increase in relation to society around you, you'll know exactly um, what to do. Or we might expect Paul to say, make sure you have Christians who are involved in politics so that they can argue from a Christian perspective in the political sphere. 
But Paul doesn't say any of those things, does he? In the face of increasing opposition from outside the church. No, as Paul speaks about the opposition that the church is facing from outside, his exhortations, his instructions are all about how the church relates internally. In the face of opposition outside, Paul urges the church to unity. That's Paul's chief instruction in these verses, his chief concern. The greatest threat to the church is not the opposition itself. The greatest threat is disunity within the church in the face of that opposition. Paul doesn't say that as opposition increases, something strange is happening to them. No, we know, don't we, that opposition was something that Jesus warned his disciples about. Paul warns about it. Peter, too, warns about it. And of course, Paul, as we'll see in these verses, actually uh, suggests that opposition can be used for the good of the church, that it can, can be used graciously by Jesus for the people's good. But the opposition must be faced up to by a united people. Now, I think it's important that I pause at this time to say that those things that I mentioned before, training and um, uh, legal advice and those things, that's all important. It's, it's great that people are equipped to articulate and defend the gospel. People who are equipped to defend the gospel are a wonderful gift to the church. Um, it's important to, assure, uh, to ensure that as a church we abide by laws and rules that, that we have to, that our documents are biblical and accurate and up to date. I'm thankful for the Christian lawyers who serve churches in the way that they do. I'm thankful for Christians who are involved in the public square, uh, living for Jesus in that context. But I want to make the same emphasis that Paul makes in this passage, that the most important, the most fundamental thing for a church facing opposition is to live out the gospel in unity with one another. And that makes sense, doesn't it, when we think about it? A united and firm and well-bound structure is a structure which can withstand force from outside. Whereas on the other hand, a fractured, faltering structure is something which is weak in the face of external forces. Think about uh, waves, the waves of the sea crashing onto a beach during a storm. And think about how those waves crashing onto the beach during a storm affect the pebbles that are on the beach. The pebbles are picked up and they're thrown about, aren't they? They're pulled back by the waves and they're thrown forward up the beach. But think about what happens when those same waves hit a seawall, a well-built, firm and solid construction. When the waves hit a seawall, they simply bounce off, don't they? They're deflected off. Paul is saying to the Philippians that they're to be a united church to, to withstand and ultimately triumph in the Lord Jesus that when they're united, they'll be able to stand firm for the gospel and not just stand firm, but move forward for the gospel in the face of difficulties. And we too are to be a united church, a church then that will be robust in the face of difficulties, able to stand firm and to move forward for the faith of the gospel in Bridgend and beyond. So three points for us this evening. That was a long introduction. Um, But three points for us this evening, all related to this theme of unity. And the first thing is this, standing firm. Standing firm, it's there in verse 27, the second half of verse 27. Paul says, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit. The Philippians were to stand firm. As opposition mounted, they were to stand firm. Think about um, armies drawing up their battle lines before a battle. And you think about the the army there drawing up their lines and then as the enemies approach, standing firm, facing up to the opposition and not giving ground for the church, for our church. Standing firm begins with the truth, doesn't it? Standing firm begins with the truth, the truth of God and the truth of his gospel. To put it another way, we need something to stand firm on and in, don't we? And it's his truth, his word That's what gives us grounding. And here's the truth. We know the truth, don't we? His word reveals the truth to us. Here's the truth. We've been created by God. That's where we start. That's where the word starts, doesn't it? But we sinned and we went on our own way. We were deserving of wrath and judgment. 
He saved us through his son, through his humble uh, becoming a servant, obedient even to the point of death. He rose from the dead and ascended to glory from where he'll come to judge the living and the dead. And he's given us his words of truth, which instructs us into the truth and instructs us as to how we're to live. He's left us his, his, his Holy Spirit to comfort us, to lead us and to assure us we exist uh, to worship him. We use his word to instruct us in all things, to thoroughly equip us for every good work. It's on these truths that we build. It's on these truths that we stand firm. And we stand firm by knowing the truth. We have to know the truth to stand firm on it, don't we? And so we have to study it so we can know it, so we can stand firm on it. And it's not good enough just to know the truth, is it? It's not good enough just to know the truth. We have to believe the truth. We stand firm not just by knowing the truth, but by believing the truth. And we stand firm not just by knowing the truth and believing the truth, but by proclaiming the truth, by proclaiming it publicly, just like we're doing right now. And we stand firm, of course, by refusing to budge on this truth, by refusing to move or compromise on this truth. Again, thinking about that um, army drawing up its battle lines, standing its ground, refusing to move, refusing to budge, instead uh, living it out. And refusing to budge was a big issue for the Philippians, wasn't it? They were facing Roman opposition. For the Philippians, during uh, the, the time that they lived, declaring Caesar as Lord would have been something that was part of public life. It perhaps would have been necessary for some of them to be able to conduct their businesses, as well as something that took place in other areas of life. For them, a big part of standing firm would have been refusing to budge on the gospel, refusing to compromise, and instead declaring that the Lord Jesus Christ alone is both Lord and Saviour. And for us too, we'll face challenges to the truth. We'll be challenged uh, to not stand firm. We'll be pressured to shift and to slide and to compromise on the truth. We can think of uh, matters or situations, places where this is happening for believers even right now, where they're being pressured to compromise on matters of the truth in their lives in different places. And it takes much wisdom, doesn't it, to stand firm for the truth. It takes much wisdom to know when to make a stand, how to make a stand in a way that honours God and that works for his glory. And Paul recognises that, doesn't he? Uh, in verse 10, again, referring back to verse 10, he prays for the Philippians that they'll be able to discern what is best, and maybe pure and blameless. In verse 9, he prays for knowledge and depth of insight so that they'll be able to, to know when to do what. It's difficult, isn't it? And that's why we must pray for each other as a, as a fellowship along the lines of verses 9 and 10. Pray for um, our children in their schools. Pray for those who are teachers. Pray for those who are in medical and caring professions and other professions as well where it's especially difficult to live and work and practice as a Christian. Face different challenges, not just in the workplace, but we can face these kinds of challenges in our families and amongst our friends and in other places as well. We must pray for one another because we don't stand firm alone, do we? We've been given to one another, as Paul says, to stand firm in the one spirit. Because as a church, we're not to be like pebbles on a beach, but to be a sea wall, standing firm together, united together by the one spirit. Standing firm in encouraging one another, in upholding one another in prayer. And we do this together in the one spirit. The word is clear, isn't it? That when we're saved, we're bound to Jesus, united to him, and we're also united together by his Holy Spirit. We don't always do this justice, do we? Often we're, um, often we're tempted to think about our relationship with God as being me and him, but we're united not just to Jesus, but together as his body. We're one in the Holy Spirit, one body, one building, one vine, to use various scriptural images. And we're instructed to stand firm in the one spirit because we are united together in the Holy Spirit. We're called, therefore, to live that out, to live out what we have been made by the Holy Spirit. Uh, we're to stand firm together in unity with him. This is the reality of who we are, that we're one in the Holy Spirit. 
And this has particular um, expression in the local church. It's true of all believers that we're one in the Holy Spirit, but it has particular um, expression in the local church. We've come together as a local church. If we're members, we've publicly committed ourselves, not just to the Lord, but to one another. So let us live that out, standing firm in the one spirit together, not budging on the truth as a church, but standing firm in what we believe and what we proclaim and encouraging and praying for one another as we seek to stand firm together. Like an army, again, to use that illustration, stands firm as the enemy approaches. We can encourage those around us to stand firm. We can strengthen one another. Think about the army standing there. Some might be scared, but an encouraging word from uh, the person standing next to them can bring confidence, can't it? Knowing that they're not standing there alone, but we're standing there together. And we're not just called in this passage to stand firm together, but to strive together as one. So standing firm in the one spirit, firstly, and then striving together as one. Again, this is there in verse 27. Paul says, stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. We're called not just to hold to the truth and proclaim the truth, but to actively live it out, to actively work out our faith in the gospel, to worship together, to share the gospel, to reach out in love to the lost. Paul returns to this point in the next chapter, doesn't he, when he says, work out your salvation, live it out, live out the implications of the gospel. And again, we're not pebbles on the beach, but a sea wall. Paul says, doing so as one. In other words, we're to pull together. We're to pull in the same direction. I don't know if you've ever seen um, anything maybe on the TV from the strongest man competitions. Have you seen anything like that where people do uh, ridiculous things to show off how strong they are? And one of the things that you sometimes see them doing on there is um, pulling a lorry or something like that along. I don't know about you, but that's not something that I could do. I couldn't pull a lorry by myself, and neither could most of you, at least, um, I don't think. But if we all got together, if all of us got together, and we all pulled together, all pulled in the same direction, then maybe we would have a chance of moving that lorry, getting it going. But sometimes it's less like pulling a lorry in one direction and uh, more like a tug of war, isn't it? That's sometimes more what happens when we think about um, churches and church life. It's less like pulling a lorry in the same direction and more like a tug of war. Rather than striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, too often churches strive against one another for their own personal preferences or whatever it might be. And of course, we can have opinions on things and on how things should be done in the church. And of course, we should share those views with one another. Um, We should uh, speak about those things. That's part of what it means to belong to the church, isn't it? Uh, When we uh, come into membership, we talk about how we're joining together to to, um, plan for the way ahead for the church. It's what we do as members. We discuss about these things. And of course, we shouldn't compromise um, on matters of core truths, on matters relating to the gospel. But there are other things, aren't there, in church life where we see different things that happen in the church and we wish that they were done differently to how they are done. But in that, we can still pull together as one, can't we? All of us will have different things in the church that we wish were done in different ways. But if they're things that are not sinful, if they're things of secondary importance, then we can still be united. We can still pull together, pull as one for the faith of the gospel. Again, I'm not advocating f- um, for remaining silent when the truth of the gospel is in danger or matters of first importance. I'm not arguing that we should have um, a silence culture in the church where people are afraid of voicing their opinion and suggesting how things should be done. No, we are to discuss together uh, and plan together the way that the church should go. But when the direction is set by the church and it's not sinful and it's not wrong, Even if we prefer things to be done in a slightly different way, we can still commit to pulling together, to pulling as one, as uh, Paul says in this uh, chapter, in these verses. And when we do that, when we pull together as one, we're strong then, aren't we? Much stronger than we are if we're doing things alone, not because of our own strength, but because of God's grace, because we're one in his spirit and by his grace. And it's then that we'll be most effective in striving for the faith of the gospel, 
Again, it's important, isn't it, uh, that we don't lose sight of the fact that Paul here is mindful of opposition in these verses. And he says in verse 28 that this standing firm and this striving together is to be done without being frightened, without being intimidated by the opposers. And that's easier said than done, isn't it? It's easy to become, inf- uh, to become frightened or to become intimidated by uh, those who oppose us, especially uh, f- when those who are opposing, the opposition have all the power. And for Paul, um, those who were opposing him, they had his very life in their hands, didn't he? And yet he says, don't be frightened and don't be intimidated. And how could Paul say that? Well, remember what we heard last time. Remember the hope that Paul had. Paul's hope was, even though they held his life in his hands, as it were, he believed and he knew that if they took his life, what would happen to him? Well, he'd depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. That's how we remain unshaken as Christians or unshakable as Christians. When for us, again, to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's how we can not be frightened or intimidated in any way by those who oppose us. We live in Christ. To live is Christ. To die is gain. And as Paul says, the the fact that people oppose is a sign that they will be destroyed and God's people will be saved and that by him. God's people standing firm in his gospel by his grace without fear will be saved by him. And of course, that doesn't mean that it will be easy. Again, imagine how hard it was for Paul. Remember that list in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 of all the different things that happened to him. For those in uh, Philippi, the opposition that they faced likely meant uh, social uh, issues for them, difficulties in their social lives. It meant suffering materially. For them too, the threat, of, um, the threat to their life must have been present to some degree. They were suffering. And that's why we see that theme here in this, uh, in this passage as well. So this is a third point. Thirdly and finally, suffering for Christ. That's the other thing that we see. So standing firm, striving together, and then suffering for Christ. And that's there in verse 29. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. It's likely, isn't it, that there'll be times in our lives where we suffer for Christ. Again, it could be financial loss or um, relational loss, struggles in family, um, social loss, part of counting the cost to follow Jesus, part of counting the cost to be faithful to him. But Paul uses an interesting phrase here in that verse 29. Grant it, for it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ. Granted, it means um, to give kindly or to give graciously. And of course, Paul is talking about the gift there, firstly, of believing in Jesus. It has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Paul suggests that suffering for Christ is in some way a gift, something that is granted graciously to us. And we remember there, don't we, the words that the apostles, um, about the apostles in Acts, where it says that they rejoiced because they were counted worthy of suffering for the name. And that shows us the truth, doesn't it? That verse and the verse here about suffering for the Lord Jesus Christ. Suffering is something that will work for our good. Suffering for Christ is something that will shape us something that will be used for his purposes in our lives. Suffering for Jesus can be a fire which refines us, uh, a chisel which shapes us and makes us beautiful. And again, something uh, which we need to remember to drive home the point. We don't suffer for the Lord Jesus alone, do we? Paul is urging the Philippians to remember to do all that they do together and in unity Paul reminds them as well that they're having the same struggle that he had. They're sharing with him in his sufferings and ultimately sharing with the Lord Jesus Christ in his sufferings. That's what we need to remember, isn't it? That when we suffer for Christ, we ultimately suffer with Christ. We have words about his suffering there in chapter two, don't we? Who being in very nature God did did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself 
by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Amen. Let's join together to sing.